GDPR was basically a Yahoo mailing list. At one point, Palmer was looking for like a tracker. And so I shipped him one of my two functioning <laughs> prototypes. And I ended up jumping in as the last member of the founding team or the first engineering hire on the team. Today, we're seeing a new dawn of AI hardware. What has caught your eye or what do you think is interesting to you? It's pretty hard, actually. It's like incredibly risky because you don't know if you're picking the right audiences, the right UX, the right modalities. The competitors are all in the space. It's incredibly frothy and they're all coming up with their own ideas in parallel to you. If you're a VC or if you're you, it's just a fan and <laughs> savant of the space. What, how do you judge a, a consumer hardware startup? So you can build a business model basically where as you succeed and capture their market share, they actually cannot replicate your business model without destroying their existing business. We're here in San Francisco, California at the HQ of Framework with CEO and founder Nirav Patel. We just filmed our interview uh, for S3 as well as had some fun lock picking. <laughs> as ventures, yeah. For context, we accidentally locked ourselves out of the office. Um, uh, equal fault, I would actually say. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Maybe more of my fault. <laughs> tomato, tomato. Um, you have a pretty amazing background when it comes to consumer hardware that I didn't even know about when I showed up today. Can you, can you kind of share your track to what led you to founding Framework? Yeah, sure. So I actually have a degree in electrical engineering, which is something that is useful as it turns out. Um, I didn't go off and do software with electrical engineering. I went build computers. Um, but after graduating from university, I went and worked at Apple. Not on the hardware, though. I worked in the, in the software space. So I was working on FaceTime and some other software. But actually, the nice thing about Apple is that I was spending like 40 to 45 hours a week, like normal human being work weeks and using all the rest of my time and energy on hardware tinkering. And so I was messing with 3D printers and trackers, like, like inertial measurement units. And then, of course, also working in VR. And so at that time, this was like, a, you know, 2011 to 2012, VR was basically a Yahoo mailing list, which was still a thing at the time. And like one community forum and in that forum there was this at the time actually kid basically named palmer lucky who was tinkering with vr stuff and there were a bunch of other hobbyists in that space and i was in there basically posting my like imu inertial, inertial measurement stuff in there and showing off this little tracker that i've been building and at one point palmer was looking for like a tracker or like a tracking system to use for vr headsets and so i shipped him one of my two functioning <laughs> prototypes and he tried it out and it was like working for him and at some point, like, obviously he took it to a place where it became a real thing and decided to start building a company around this. And then right after the Kickstarter, Palmer and team at Oculus were looking for a tracking device because the one they were using wasn't working super well for them. And so Palmer reached out to me and I ended up jumping in as basically either like the last member of the founding team or the first higher engineering hire on the team. For Oculus. For Oculus, yeah. And so I was there, I was, you know, the eighth person in and built up the hardware team basically from myself to about 80 people over the course of a few years. And obviously we shipped some, some fun, <laughs> fun hardware throughout that time. Obviously consumer hardware is hard. And earlier when filming, you mentioned that like one of the last really modern, successful consumer hardware companies was Oculus. I would agree. Can you elaborate on, on what you think works so well for you? Yeah, this is interesting. This was... Um, it's kind of stereotypical startup rocket ship uh, of, you know, stuff like moving super quickly and stuff's like falling out and people are flying out the, out the door, but we're, you know, maintaining like massive growth and velocity. And the, the key thing, the key learning that I had, especially from a hardware standpoint, was being really, really deliberate about audiences and being incredibly diligent on iteration speed. And so the thing that worked incredibly well for us in Oculus was that we knew from the start that there was no way we're going to build a consumer VR headset starting from a blank slate and be able to have that work. Like consumer was, was or VR was a dirty word at that point. Like, you know, it died decades ago from a computer or a consumer standpoint. And so we started with a very deliberate focus on developers. And so we built a dev kit in six months and shipped it out to developers. And we got a bunch of learnings from what they were using it for and built another dev kit another year after that and shipped that out and got more learnings. And so that iteration speed with hardware was just like immensely, immensely valuable to break open a new category. So you, you leave Oculus eventually. And what were some of what, what was on your mind? Like next, were you thinking immediately of going into framework? Did, <laughs> like what was did you did you tinker around with some other stuff? Yeah, so we all 
of us who, you know, were as were part of Oculus during the acquisition, we all got these five year vesting <laughs> periods. And so by the end of the five years, those of us who were left there is, had already spent the last year thinking about what we wanted to do next. Um, cause you know, we, we went from being a 50 person team at the time we were acquired to being, I don't know, I guess like 5,000 people after five years, probably more than that actually in AR, VR and Facebook at the time. And our iteration speed had slowed down. We had a bunch of bureaucracy. We reset the roadmap over and over again. There's a bunch of internal disagreement and misalignment around like who the target audiences should be for VR. And so it's just very obvious to me that like, this is not a place to build. This is not a place to actually go and be able to move quickly and have a small team and be able to actually make real impact, be able to make real change. And so, you know, from a, probably a year prior to that five-year vest ending point, I started thinking about what I wanted to do. And I knew, obviously, that I needed to do consumer hardware. Built up, like, not just, like, the expertise, but also just, like, the passion to go and build hardware, build interesting hardware. And I spent that year thinking about, really, actually, not what was the hardware I needed to build, but fundamentally, why consumer hardware fails so often. Like, what is it that caused this massive graveyard of consumer electronics companies and so I actually just started a Google Doc and listed out, like, what are the plausible business models I could take that account for the reasons that most of these companies are failing and eventually came to the one that clicked, which was the model we're doing, which is this idea of building an install base and being able to re-engage that install base by building our products to be modular and upgradable and repairable. So we talked a lot about that in the episode, and I don't feel really need to ask you yeah. about it here because you did such a great job explaining it, explaining it there. But I am curious a little bit to talk about kind of the, the marketing and go-to-market strategy for that. And, and specifically, <laughs> my first interaction with Framework was a Linus Tech Tip video, yes. as you mastered the plan, <laughs> like years ago. Um, and now recently, the, the videos I thought a few weeks ago when I saw on Turge Sour, I was like, oh no, for, for context, like Linus's kind of thumbnail for these videos is like the worst investment I've ever made. <laughs> And you click on it and it's actually like a gleaming, like very excited saying you're doing everything right. Yeah. Which from a reviewer as controversial and negative as Linus can be, I think for all the right reasons, that's like really high praise. Sure, right. Um, t- can you talk about sort of what, what, what the initial strategy for you guys was for going to market and, and how you navigate that, especially when like, you know, at the end of the day, you have to give a reviewer like Linus or, or someone else a thing and then kind of let them tear it apart. Yeah, the thing that worked really well for us, actually, is that notebooks are such a mature space. And basically, if you're a reviewer doing laptop reviews, you're pretty much reviewing the same product over and over again every year. And so we went through right from the start and just read a bunch of reviews, watched a bunch of YouTube reviews, and looked at what are people complaining about? What are they saying needs to change? And actually just built the product around that. So like, oftentimes, it's just very basic things like, well, these keyboards seem to be getting worse year over year. Like, why is that? Or my ports uh, keep disappearing. Like I, there's like one port left on this laptop. What do they want me to do with this thing? <laughs> um, or even stuff like like the webcam. Why is the webcam so shitty? And when we're all spending all this time on, you know, at the time I get Zoom and Skype and things like that. Uh, and so for us, when we went out to reviewers with our framework laptop the first time around, we basically just said like, this is different than any other laptop that you can review. This is like a, an interesting product that actually very deliberately and specifically addresses the complaints that you and consumers have had about notebooks now for a decade running. We actually went and fixed it. And the first response was always like, like, really? (laughs) Did you? (laughs) Um, But it was enough to get in the door and get a device, get hardware into people's hands. They're curious enough to like actually test the claims. And as they tested the claims, they saw like, oh yeah, they they actually did it. I mean, obviously the first go around wasn't perfect. There were things we needed to improve, but we nailed enough of it. And the overall product experience was there and the product was interesting enough that it just made for this incredibly compelling content. Like these videos and these articles, they were not reviewing the same laptop every year with like a slightly different industrial design. It was, this is fundamentally actually this pretty interesting approach to consumer electronics. And so Linus especially made a video where he was just like over the moon. And you're right, like he is justifiably negative a lot about consumer electronics and computing. And so for us to come in as a startup and build something that was like genuine and address the things that normally he would rail about, he was pretty excited. That's that's amazing. I, I think um, a lot of people nowadays, uh, potential builders or, or future founders or even current founders think about what they really ideally want to build. And a lot of people I think about building real physical things now. 
and just going straight into the deep end of like going into a saturated space like notebooks and being like, yeah, we're going to build a notebook. It seemed incredibly <laughs> hard. Did you, what are some of your kind of best, best tips and advice for building real things that maybe are already in a, in a relatively dominated market and like what are the right ways to tackle that or think about that problem? Right. It actually gives you a lot of clarity to enter a category that's just incredibly mature and saturated where you know who the competitors are. You know there's no other startup that's going to show up right around the corner with something that's competing in your space. You know exactly who you're competing with. You know exactly who your customers are because the category is saturated and you know the competitive dynamics. And so like there's actually a lot of a lot of benefit to operating in such a mature category. Whereas if you're charting a total blank slate new category, like, you know, let's say AR, VR five years ago or 10 years ago now, I guess, or, you know, AI hardware today, it's pretty hard, actually. It's like incredibly risky because you don't know if you're picking the right audiences or the right UX, the right modalities, and the competitors are all, you know, in the space, it's incredibly frothy and they're all coming up with their own ideas in parallel to you. And so you don't know if you're going to win or not. You don't know if you're going to crack the nut on it. But for us in consumer electronics categories that are mature, like laptops, our competitors are Dell, HP, Lenovo, <laughs> Acer, Asus, these like pretty slow moving bureaucracies that don't have a lot of brand love, that have incredibly predictable product roadmaps, and we know exactly what the problems are with their products. And so for us breaking those categories, it's one, let's make sure we get the table stakes right. Like we have to have a good competitive cost effective notebook that has the base functionality that we need. And two, let's actually go and address the things that people are complaining about. And in doing that, we very quickly got awareness and credibility. You know, we got awareness because every tech publication that's reviewing a notebook wants this new exciting notebook that's solving the problems they're complaining about. And then two, credibility that a lot of these like incredibly powerful and influential individuals like Linus or like Cory Doctorow, actually, who's, you know, big for like, uh, you know, consumer rights and consumer freedoms had great things to say right from the start because we solved the things that that they were concerned about. You mentioned a little bit uh, that going into a a big kind of dominated space is in some ways easier because you can see right of the land, you know what monsters are out there. Um, (laughs) But today we're we're kind of seeing a new dawn of AI hardware. Right. And like it feels like every few weeks there is a new a new player on the scene. What what has caught your eye or what do you think is interesting to you um, in the space in general? Yeah, well, actually, one other thing on your last question that I think is important to call out is the business model angle of it, which is that when you see the incumbents, you're in this mature market, you know what their business models are, you can actually build a business model that's counter positioned against theirs. So you can build a business model basically where as you succeed and capture their market share, they actually cannot replicate your business model without destroying their existing business. And so for us, we think about like Dell, HP, Lenovo, their business is that notebooks are a mature market. It's incredibly predictable what the replacement cycles are going to be, and their market share is going to remain roughly stable. And so their entire business is, you know, a five-year plan of we're going to sell this many notebooks every year because this is how many are getting replaced. Whereas for us, we're building products that last longer. Our business model is we want your laptop to last twice as long, and we're going to re-engage you as you go. But for a Dell or an HP or Nova, they would have to look at their five-year plan and say, okay, well, we could do that, but we'd have to cut our revenue in half and our unit count in half. And that's not a transformation that you can do at that scale. I, I hadn't thought of it that way. There's been so many nuggets from, from filming this today that, that have been like, wow, I've never <laughs> considered consumer hardware that way. I'm very glad we've, we've done this. Um, I would, I would like to hear, you yeah, know, your AI takes about some of the AI hardware space right now. Yeah, I think, I think AI hardware is obviously an incredibly interesting category. I think that... It is very likely to be the case, it's almost certain to be the case that having a personal AI that carries along with you, that has ambient awareness, that has contextual awareness, that has memory, that's there basically as a companion to you, like that is going to happen. Like it's a thing that makes enough sense. There are enough reasons for that to be a useful thing to, for a person to have that like that's going to happen. And then the key question, of course, is like, what is the user interface? What's the user experience? What's the input modality? What's the output modality? What's this physical thing that you're going to feel comfortable as a consumer carrying around with you? What are the implications, like the social implications of carrying it around with you? And obviously there are these now probably, you know, 20 or 30 different startups that are all testing different slices of this, you know, testing different places that it's worn, different ways that you interact with it, different ways that it remembers your context and the places it's been with you. And it's very likely the case that 
most of them are going to fail. Most of them are going to get it wrong. And it's actually not even clear today, looking at that open field, which ones are going to succeed and which ones are going to fail. And it's possible that, you know, maybe some combination of a few of them are going to figure it out or that there are a few different paths that resonate with different customer bases. But I think the key thing that's really important is like going back to this learning from Oculus, that the ones that are going to succeed are actually probably not even necessarily the ones that are getting it right on the first go around, like actually building the right device the first time. But they're the ones that are iterating quickly and efficiently enough that they can navigate their way there. So like a company, I'm not going to name names, but a company that, let's say, gets to 500 people before it ships the first product. It's tough. Yeah, the company's not iterating quickly enough. They've baked in a big company mentality and bureaucracy and are doing so without the big company moat and product market fit and bank account that they would need to succeed at that. Speaking of bank account, you guys have had an incredible impact on the consumer laptop community. You've shipped a lot of these things, but you haven't raised like a scary amount of money. Like, can you talk more about that? That's right. We've impressive. been very efficient deliberately. Yes. <laughs> And part of it is just the reality that if even if we try to go out there and raise large sums of money, no one's going to give us large sums of money to build a laptop. Like, that's just not in the cards. So we're obviously very efficient about, especially in the early days before we proved that there actually is an audience for this, early set of audiences um, that we can build incredibly efficiently. So we did a $9 million seed round at the beginning of 2021. And then we did an $18 million Series A at the beginning of 2022. And we haven't raised since then. Um, that is a small amount of money for what we're building. <laughs> um, and we're actually, there have been points in time where we've been cash flow positive and then back to cash flow negative based on like how much we're spending on R&D at any given point. But philosophically, the way we think about fundraising is we better make sure that the products that we're building are paying for themselves and that we're only doing fundraising in a way that's enabling horizontal expansion into new product categories or new audiences where if something goes wrong on that new product or that audience doesn't pan out the way we thought it would, that the business that we're already operating is still able to operate in a self-sufficient manner. You, you talked a lot about the iteration cycle is really the, 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 the like trick in your mind to making great consumer hardware. Um, what, what has been one of the hardest technical or engineering problems that you've run into and, and how did you guys uh, engineer out of it? Yeah, one of these things is just, it's just, there's a certain speed of light to building hardware that, you know, you can't exceed the pace of uh, to build, especially robust consumer hardware, something that like lives up to the expectations of of what a consumer needs. And the challenge for this, of course, is that there are a bunch of one-way doors when you go down that product development path. So let's say you're building a laptop, which we've done now a couple of times, and you or trying to build out the development schedule, that's like 18 to 24 months from like the first, you know, tinkling of an idea of like, yeah, we want to build this thing to this thing being out there in consumers' hands. And almost like every few months throughout that process, there's a one-way door where if we tried to back out of that door, we'd have to reset that entire schedule. And so a lot of this is just being very, very thorough and deliberate on doing as much research as you can up front on what are the competitive dynamics? What are the architectures that are available out there? Who are the audiences we're trying to reach? What's going to resonate with them? And then trying to test as early as you can throughout. And so obviously for consumer products, a lot of that is just dog fooding. It's you know eating your own dog food, using your own products, and doing so even when it's so flaky that like you're spending half your day wrestling with your hardware and your firmware trying to get the product to work for you. But that's how you, you, know, you build good products by using your product. What emerging research or technologies in the next kind of five, 10 years uh, are super exciting to you? I'm sure literally everyone answers this the same way. It's, it's, it's AI, right? It's like, what, what's going to happen when we do have that companion that has memory that's carried along with you, that has enough sensing ability, enough intelligence to actually be, you know, at your, at your level, maybe even, but at least like useful enough that, that it augments you in a way that, uh, smartphone or a computer today can't because it's there with you at all at all points this this next question might be a little weird but i think it's i think it's super valuable can you try to describe how you think <laughs> what, I, what i mean by that is like sure. are, there, are there any lenses or mental models you kind of commonly find yourself looking at the world through or tackling problems through yeah how i think a lot of how i think is actually trying to 
especially in the, in the space that we're in, in this like very mature space, it's actually trying to like work backwards at every moment from something that exists in the world to understanding why that thing exists and like how it existed in the way that it exists. And sometimes that's like, there's like very concrete aspects of that, which is like buying a consumer electronics product that I think is interesting and taking it apart and trying to figure out like, why did they make that decision? What was the set of constraints that forced that instead of maybe the five other ways that could have gone? And then wherever it's possible, going and actually trying to like find the people who made those decisions and go and ask them, why did you make that decision? You can't always do that, but when you can, like you end up learning like a lot about the the thought process that went into developing that thing. And like just every time you approach a problem that way or just an end result or product or a service or process or business or whatever it is, like, you know, as you are doing, going and figuring out why did you build your business that way? Uh, you end up learning a lot, right? You like you learn about other people's thought models and see like what can you carry forward in your own. So framework obviously is making laptops. It's a, a framework for making laptops, but I think you have ambitions of in the future doing other things and other kinds of hardware. Can you talk about how you kind of master plan for this in the future? Um, right. Like how do you eventually? I assume you would need to become quite large to do a really exciting number of cool products. How do you avoid the bureaucracy or sure. how do you plan around <laughs> that? Like. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Yeah, so we're not just a laptop company. We started with laptops, but you know, going back to this business model thing, actually the business model did come first. This was not, I want to build a laptop. Let me go start a company to build a laptop. This is, I want to fix consumer electronics. Let me come up with a business model that actually enables that. And then let me think about what's the right first product to build. And I actually did have like similar like Google Doc filled with like every time I had an idea of like, okay, what about this category, this category, this category? And laptops became the category that was most obvious to start with because it is at the end of that saturation curve, but also because there was that core audience that we could start with where the frustrations were just very, very visible and obvious. So we knew we could go in front of with a product and and get interested and have something that resonates very quickly. But then we look across consumer electronics and really see kind of that same behavior repeat itself in a number of different categories. Basically a mature category stable, big incumbents, not a lot of change in the use cases or technologies year over year, but also that have maybe a subset of audiences that are these early adopters that want more than what they're getting today. What, what are some of the common mistakes and pitfalls you see consumer hardware or co- newer companies falling into? Yeah, the most common mistake for consumer electronics, for consumer hardware is trying to replicate Apple. Right. Like Apple is the most successful consumer electronics company. And so people, I think, look at that and say, like, okay, we want that ethos. We want that design mentality. We want that industrial design. Or even we want, you know, we want that brand. We want that approach. We want our products to feel that way. And then they take that and then attempt to recreate Apple inside of a startup. And oftentimes this is ex Apple people or people hiring a bunch of people out of Apple and trying to, to build that. And it just doesn't work. You end up with these slow, bloated bureaucratic companies where you're burning immense amounts of money because you're trying to do absolutely everything in-house when what you need to do as a startup, especially in a consumer space, especially in a consumer hardware space, is have an incredibly lean, efficient team that can iterate really quickly and chart that careful course testing those different audiences and products to to get PMF, to get self-sufficiency. And then you can start to invest and start to capture things in-house that you think are going to be important as you grow. And you can't start that way. What about consumer hardware? Like initially back even before Oculus and today really excites you. And it's yeah. you. some of this is just like, I don't know, I'm a gadget fiend. You know, it's like I like I see like some like cool device, like I like the yeah. physicality of it. I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. And um, they you know, starting from a young age, just, you know, tearing stuff down, seeing how it works, putting it back together, hoping it works again. And then just like being that over the course of, you know, entire time eventually you get to a place where if you, you know, happen to follow the right course of uh, of like learning things and companies you can build your own versions of it what are what are some of the you mentioned like learning kind of rabbit holes and, and paths what are what are some of the for you as a founder um been the most helpful learning resources or or, or people or, or or experiences that that you've had in your journey yeah this is something that doesn't just apply to consumer hardware this is like just generally approach to to startups is going and getting your hands dirty and doing every role that you need to yourself so you understand it well enough to figure out who to hire um, and so like in in oculus but especially in framework you know we started as a team of myself and hiring or bringing three folks right at the start who i was familiar with in the past 
But all of us came from a little bit more of a similar background of like, you know, being into electronics. One person has had an e-commerce background and building a product like this requires a much, much broader skill set. And so that turned into like, okay, let me figure out what it means to do marketing or, you know, go and try to do PR and bring in external PR folks or figure out how to do supply chain or how to do logistics and do it just enough, just to the right point of being able to go out there and start talking to people in the space and trying to convince the right person to join. Because there's almost a risk if you go too down the rabbit hole on one thing, you'll like overthink about it or overconsider <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. You'll go too far. Well, I think the bigger risk is that you'll go too far in one area when actually like, especially if you're the founder or CEO, that you need to be a bit broader and explore the next open space and not get attached to the thing that you can hire somebody who's better than you at. Sure. Earlier when we were filming, you mentioned that like getting that early adopter curve and, and like marketing correctly. Yeah. And, and you, I think you said mapping through the different audiences, right. which is like such a cool way to think about it. Um, can you talk about, you've clearly done this successfully like in your, your current stage, but can you talk about how like you, you mentioned that like sometimes a single sentence and an image can like, right. they immediately get it. Can you talk about your, in your team's experience in developing that and, and working through that from the, specifically the marketing and branding side of the business? Yeah, big part of this is is transparency. It's like it's being authentic, but not being authentic in a way where like you're trying to be authentic and you're like trying to like okay, let's try to make it authentic. We'll feel like we're authentic. It's being authentic by like actually taking actions that resonate with your audiences. And so a big thing that we did early on, for example, is opening up the reference designs and documentation and open source licenses around a bunch of our module systems. So like our expansion cards, for example. We just posted a repository on GitHub with the with the specs with some reference designs, and so if you're, uh, you know, a tinker or a DIY or you're a hardware enthusiast, getting that instant credibility of being able to see all the way down to the source code and the CAD of this new module system that was like immediately that consumer seeing like, oh yeah, this company is like they're not just you know it's not just talk they're actually doing it, um, or for you know the the Linux user going out there from the beginning and and saying like hey, let's support Linux hard with new hardware. There's actually like a lot that goes into it, a lot that goes into making it stable. And we know it's not going to be perfect at first, but like we actually care about this. A bunch of our people in our team internally, we use Linux. And so we're going to go out there and make sure this product works really well for Linux. And we're going to make sure it continues to get better and better as we go. And that's just, it's just a message that resonates because it's actually true. This, this might be a little bit of a long answer and a little rambly, which is totally cool if it is. Uh, that's what I would, I would hope for it. But like, <laughs> can you walk me through from like state zero of the, the first framework laptop to yeah. it's in people's hands, what that design production review, like what was that journey? What's the story there? What was that? Yeah. Journey? So this is a fun one. So we started in January, 2020, but actually for a couple months before that, I'd already been going out there and pitching suppliers. Actually pitching suppliers is a lot like pitching VCs for folks who are familiar with that. You kind of have to go out there and expect to get rejected, you know, nine out of 10 times. And why are they rejecting normally? Yeah, normally it's, uh, it's ultimately an ROI question that like they have to look at what you're building and believe that there is, you know, relatively near to midterm pass for them to make money up. And if you're a startup, you're either going to you and, and or you're going to them and they know that there's a very high likelihood that you're going to fail. And so they have to, just like a VC does, kind of look at it from a perspective of, you know, weighing those probabilities, building a portfolio. But actually, especially for manufacturers, having that startup mindset, like there are a lot of manufacturers who look at startups and say, like, come back when you've got volume and we'll talk. But there are others that approach it more from mindset of like, okay, we've done this in the past. We started with a customer that came in as a new company with zero volume, and now they're our second biggest customer. And we want to try to diversify. We want to find the next one. We want to help them grow. And so there's a little bit of a, like a matchmaking process there of going out there and pitching and seeing not just who's capable of physically building the thing that you're doing, but who wants to engage with you at a level where they're going to help you grow and you're going to grow together. And so right from the beginning, it was, you know, actually before we even incorporated as a company, I was out there pitching, pretending to be a company basically with my, with my business card <laughs> and, and, you know, going out to Taiwan and pitching the, you know, five different uh, manufacturers that make basically like 95% of the laptops that are out there and happened to get that match make uh, with Compal, which is I think the second or third largest, but they actually, they saw what we were doing and their first reaction was like, that's not going to work. And then after a few more hours of kind of like whiteboarding and like running through the constraints, like, okay, I could see how this could work. 
And then that turned into us doing basically a proof of concept phase with them, where normally, so just uh, you know, providing a bit of context around consumer electronics, or consumer hardware, normally when you're going to a manufacturer, you want to kick off a program with them, you would go in and run an RFQ, a request for quotation, where you have a design package with, let's say, a complete industrial design, pretty complete electrical architecture, maybe a set of module suppliers who are building the modules that that final manufacturer wouldn't build. And there's enough detail there that they can quote that program and you can look at that quote, negotiate it, and decide to kick off. Obviously, as you know, a one-person team and then a, fo- a four-person team right at the start, we didn't have that maturity. We didn't have anything, really. We had, you know, napkin sketch level of here's what a repairable, upgradable laptop looks like. And so instead of trying to jump right into an RFQ that would have been, you know, very difficult for a manufacturer to engage in, we did a proof of concept phase. So we spent the first few months, actually hired our first team member in Taiwan, who's our head of industrial design. Nick is just like an incredible, incredible designer. Um, and started with a proof of concept, which was awesome because it meant that like we could go in instead of a final product, go in with like, okay, we're going to do a four month phase where the entire purpose of this phase is to start with these constraints and start with these goals. And we're going to iterate our way to an industrial design and architecture that satisfies those goals, or we're going to adjust the goals we have to, which was going really well until, uh, like February, March, 2020, (laughs) when the borders all locked down. Um, but luckily we had Nick out there in Taiwan. So here we were, the rest of us in the U S Nick out there in Taiwan and started to slowly build this team in Taiwan to make it work. Um, and even, you know, hired our head of supply chain or first supply chain hire here in the U S and like, you know, we couldn't go and visit our suppliers to like remotely try to manage this process and shipping stuff around, uh, and, you know, remotely negotiating with people who we can't get face to face with. And we were able to make it work. And a lot of it does go down to being in a mature category, being very deliberate about what the goals and non-goals are of the product. And then for us, really critically, building a team, starting to build a team in Taiwan very, very early so that that team can synchronize with us internally, be culturally aligned, be mission aligned, and be able to go and work locally with the R&D and design counterparts, the manufacturer, be able to go to the factory and make sure that things are actually moving. And so we went from basically like March 2020, the last time we went out to remove this February 2020, but the last time we went out there to sometime, I think like in late 2021 or tw- even 2022, before we could go back out to Taiwan and we shipped a product in the meantime. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> How from, from that initial like fake business card uh, interaction yeah. to today where you're making these at volume, how many R&D kind of iteration cycles between the act and for the actual product were there? Yeah. So for something like a, a notebook, the general goal is to be able to do, we call an EV, there's similar words uh, in different companies, but they sometimes have slightly different meanings, but an EVT and then a DVT1, a DVT2, and then ramping into mass production. But basically you start for, for us, it was before the EVT, this proof of concept phase, where we build a non-functioning, but ID and mechanism complete version of the product. And then a non-form factor functioning electrical architecture to prove the electrical architecture works. And then in that EVT phase, take those two proof of concept objects and basically merge them into a functioning form factor version of the product. And with that, obviously you, you wouldn't tool up for that because you, you would never want to you know kick off tooling for something that's that unproven. And so it's, it's all prototype basically, like CNC stuff, um, some parts that are 3D printed, and then uh, some of the modules actually already at that point were the real final modules. So some things like the battery, for example, we actually go out there preemptively, do an RFQ, like an actual RFQ for the battery, and then actually start to tune the rest of the system around some of these modules that due to their lead times, we actually had to lock into place as like a final design and then adjust the rest of the system to make it fit. Um, but it went, it went incredibly smoothly, actually, like unusually smoothly, like 18 months is like the normal timeline for a company that's got it all figured out, <laughs> but we were able to actually make it work as a startup. Um, and honestly, some of it was actually luck that we, you know, we went through each one of those phases, proof of concept, each one of those, uh, NPI new product introduction builds, and we didn't blow any of the builds basically like the builds worked. We learned what we needed to. The design, like the electrical architecture, the mechanical architecture, the tooling all worked. Nothing 
ended up in a place where we had to like hit the reset button and repeat a phase, which you can do and is, is you know relatively normal when you're building new product categories, but ends up being obviously quite expensive, especially in a startup where you're thinking about your runway. You're basically then uh, you know pulling the cliff in by three months if you decide that well we need another iteration phase, but we managed to navigate it without that. Has there been something in founding the framework and, and building it that has been way harder than you expected originally? <laughs> Well, I expected fundraising to be hard, but even even with that in mind, fundraising was hard. Uh, we're at the intersection of consumer, which people don't like, and hardware, which people don't like. <laughs> so consumer hardware is it's hard because uh, you know a lot of people will just look at it. And actually, the thing that we ran into that, that surprised me that uh, ended up being oftentimes the biggest challenge was that almost every VC firm has made some one single bet on a consumer hardware company that ended up being an incredibly high profile failure and no one wants to be the one to stick their neck out again and do it again. Um, and so, you know, if what, if you're, you know, the, the VC firm that led Juicero's series A, you're not going to look at consumer electronics the same way after that, uh, but we ended up finding, you know, really credible set of investors who actually did believe us or not afraid of consumer or not afraid of hardware. If you're a VC or if you're you, it's just a fan and <laughs> savant of the space. What, how do you judge a, a consumer hardware startup? Yeah, scrappiness is, is definitely key. And a lot of it goes down to that mentality around one iteration and then two, what companies that founder or that team looks at for inspiration for an operating mode and an execution mode. Like if it's a team where you're talking to them and the sense you're getting is like, these people are, you know, there's a poster of Steve Jobs on the wall and they're trying to, someone's wearing a turtleneck or something. They're trying to like recreate Apple. Like you should probably watch out the door. But, you know, if you're talking to, you know, a five person team and they have a functioning proof of concept or even like a functioning development kit that they're actually get, already getting into like developer hands or early adopter hands, like that's a good indicator. And like, if they've got that mentality of like, iterating fast, testing fast, closing the loop fast, meaning closing the loop with a, an actual customer in the loop. Like that is, is something you need to see in consumer electronics. Uh, my, my last question for you is, uh, it's a little odd again, but I think it's, uh, it's interesting to ask founders, what is your current life philosophy? <laughs> my current life philosophy. Wow. What a, yeah, what a question. My current life philosophy. I mean, my, my personal philosophy is actually that I've, I've only got so many years on this earth, right? Like I want to, I want to do the thing that I think needs to be done that other people want to see done, but maybe don't have the capability or weren't fortunate enough to be in the position that I was fortunate enough to be in, which is like having gone through a successful startup exit and early member of the team to go and solve those problems. Like problems that I think are important, that are impactful to the world, that can meaningfully change and improve things for a number of people out there. I want to spend my time and energy doing that. But I also want to do it in a way that we're building a team and a culture where not everyone has to have the, you know, the grind mindset that we can have basically a positive and healthy internal <laughs> culture where like people like, you know, we're here on a Saturday, this office is, is empty and it's empty on purpose. Like I don't want people in the office on Saturday. I want people with their friends and families or out there in nature on, on Saturdays. So like a big part of this is like, well, yeah, we want to change the world, but we want to do it with a team that's happy and healthy. That's I, I, that's a pretty good life philosophy and building philosophy. Um, this is awesome. Thank you for taking time to do this and thanks for building framework. No, of course. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Dude, we did it. That was fantastic. <laughs> Lock picks, battery failures, key failures. Oh man, thanks for, thanks.